Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor. Hope everybody's doing well. For episode 26 that I have here for my second show of 2019, I wanted to, this is really going to be a car focused show, just more, more, some more announcements coming out, obviously, from CES and some other places. So I want to get right into that. Now, my first story before I start talking about some of the EVs. I talked in the last show about 2018 global EV sales, and I talked about uh, the record number, and I included Canada into that mix. And in my conversations, I mentioned Ontario that we that I had thought that we were still doing quite well, even though our incentives went away in September of 2018. Well, a couple of days after I that show went out, there was a, of course it always ha always happens after I do a show, something comes out. But that's why I always like to go back and talk about things. But as an article that came out that talked about that actual EV sales in Ontario had pretty well come to almost a standstill from uh, when the incentive stopped, uh, at least until the end of 2018, according to this report. Uh, now, this report, this article talked about the Nissan Leaf, the BMW i3, and the Chevy Bolt as cars um, from a sales perspective. So we know that the Model 3 has done fairly, has done really well in Canada as well as the rest of the world. So that's continuing to drive EV adoption, which is good. But some of the other models have not fared so well. So the Nissan Leaf sold about 700 units in August and then in November in Ontario, this is again Ontario only, um, they only sold 10 according to this report. Uh, in fact, those figures were from Nissan Canada. Um, now Quebec, they're, they're 300 or so, something like that. So Quebec is still chugging along, no problem. So uh, it seems, now uh, from a Bolt perspective, it looks like that's down 30% year over year. And from a BMW i3 perspective, that they're down about 20% or so, or possibly even more uh, as well. So there definitely has seen a decline in EV interest in a lot of those storefronts. So um, it's, you know, it's unfortunate that that's happened here in Ontario. Again, there, uh, I don't have Ionic numbers. I don't have any of the plug-in hybrid numbers. I know that Mitsubishi has done very well from the Outlander plug-in hybrids so um, that's probably picking up you know carrying some of the plug-in weight from that perspective uh, but again with the incentives uh, that's probably slowed down as well now there is hope in our horizon that we're waiting to see whether the our federal government from ottawa will offer some sort of alternative rebates programs there, there's talk about you know coming out with something that's a bit more tenable from a cost credit perspective because look we got 14,000 bucks yeah you know, that's pretty pretty darn good uh, some see that as quite high it certainly can be i think you know certainly some sort of mid ground is uh, could really help to stimulate ev adoption uh, we've talked about maybe a gst or an hst credit or something like that as well or not paying certain amounts of tax so we'll have to see what happens but i just wanted to come out and uh, uh, let pe folks know that i got this information after i did the last show and it seems like Sales in Canada are still doing very well overall, but Ontario has actually slowed down. So I'll keep my eye and see, look at the first quarter stats here in Ontario and see if that if things pick up. And that's, again, important why I do what I do here on the show and why a lot of you others have EVs and a lot of you others talk to people and are part of EV clubs and maybe do other shows, your own shows and, and your own uh, Twitters and all this kind of stuff to promote EVs. It's, it's all about education, right? Letting people know what's out there and what could work for their lifestyle. All right, so I'm going to get right into cars now. So first thing is Tesla. So last time I talked about orders in Europe being opened. Um, so in the early part of January, uh, the doors open, the floodgates open for public orders now for the Tesla Model 3, where it turns out a couple, again, about a day or so after that did that show, uh, a report came out that as of January 3rd, there were almost 14,000 orders already for the Model th uh, 3s. Um, those were by reservation holders because they're the only ones that could order at that particular time. Of course, uh, Norway leading as far as the number of orders there and uh, Germany being second and then Switzerland being third as far as the initial uptake for the Model 3 ordering process in Europe. So I'll keep my eye on this. I know that it, the UK is anxiously awaiting further details on their status, uh, but that's all good news for Tesla as they continue to uh, kick out the Model 3s at 7,000 a month, not 7,000 a week, as I had said on the last show, got a little excited there. I, the last estimate I heard was about 1,400 a week, so 7,000 or ish or so a month, which seems to be their cadence right now. Hopefully, maybe they can even increase that. We'll have to see. But uh, good to see Tesla doing that. 
Now, on that note with Tesla, there was a uh, some stats that came out that looked at the different automakers and how they did for 2018. And Tesla has actually uh, come up now to be the 20th most popular brand in the United States. And that's quite an accomplishment. You know, the United States is very much a car culture, uh, very much a driving mentality, uh, as we are in Canada as well as North America in general. Uh, we know that 2018 has been an exceptional year for Tesla in their increased sales, uh, topping about 200,000 or so, um, which put the brand, as I mentioned, into number 20. And that actually gave them a 1.15% percent market share. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, 1.15% of a US market share, but the US market share is pretty big. And that 1.15% is really a good number. I mean, why why do uh, manufacturers make compliance cars. You may have heard that before. Uh, that's obviously started with California and the state of California mandating for, through CARB that vendors shall, you know, manufacturers, if they're going to sell anything in California, they have to have vehicles that meet low emission targets and low emission offerings. That market is huge. The California market alone is just an unbelievably huge car market on a year over year basis. So for Tesla to get 1.15%, now that puts them actually ahead of Chrysler Motors in the U.S., believe it or not, with that market share. Number one being Ford. Most of those are F-150 pickup trucks. We know it. We get it. It's a huge brand for them. That's about 13% market share for, for Ford. But if I go down the Tesla at their 1.15, they beat out Chrysler at not even 1% market share. Chrysler is below at 0.96% with about 165,000 or so and change 166,000 vehicles sold in uh, the United States in 2018 versus Tesla's about 197, almost 198,000 vehicles. You know, uh, I definitely see 2019 as a year that Tesla as a brand in the U.S. will certainly move up the food chain. Uh, but good on Tesla for that. So I wasn't sure if you guys were aware of that. Um, but let's keep an eye and see how they do for 2019. All right, so let me switch gears to Nissan. It's been a very exciting week for Nissan. As you can tell, I'm excited about it. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of the Leaf, as many know. It does have shortcomings, and I'm the first person to admit those shortcomings. But overall, as a price value vehicle, I think it's a great view, great battery, all electric battery vehicle to get into. So this week was the uh, release or the announcement of the, the updated Leaf. Uh, this is going to be what Nissan calls the Leaf E+. Plus. And uh, they announced it yesterday at the CES show. So I, I immediately got an email from Nissan Canada late last night with all the details of it and uh, t was tweeting some stuff out. But I wanted to tape the show and get it out to you to give you some more details in case you haven't been following that. So this is not going to replace the 40 kilowatt hour model. It's just is going to be in addition to the 40 kilowatt. That's my understanding. So you'll be able to pick from two models. Now the 60, uh, the E plus is going to be based on a 62 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, which is a higher, produces about 40% more power output uh, to the powertrain. Has an EPA rating right now of about 363 kilometers or 226 miles based on that. Um, it's going to look exactly the same as the, the, e, the LEAF does today, the 2018 LEAF does. So there's really no changes to body styling. There's a couple of small fascia changes. I think something small in the front uh, uh, as far as the screen goes, uh, the front grille a little bit. Um, and oh, there's a couple of emblems here and there, but really not much more. You know, you'd have to look hard to kind of see that it was the, the bigger battery version of the Nissan LEAF. Uh, you know, just to put this in perspective, Nissan has sold uh, over 380,000 now Nissan LEAFs. So they're still the number one single uh, car line or single uh, model of electric vehicle to sell in the world. Tesla, of course, is catching up with the Model 3. Now, all these, uh, the new Leafs, nothing changes from a pro pilot perspective, from the e paddle and all that intelligent mobility stuff that I've talked about before. So, some of the other specs about the new Leaf uh, I mentioned the, the, uh, the bigger battery. Uh, the power output, as I mentioned, is 40% more, which uh, also includes a, uh, an update, a bigger motor. It's a 160 kilowatt motor which uh, produces about 250 foot pounds or 340 newton meters of torque so even more uh, obviously it'll give you greater accelerations from from you know getting up to highway speeds and and uh, getting out the pass uh, about 13 percent quicker they've increased the top speed 10 percent as well it's actually going to come standard with 70 kilowatt of uh, fast charging but it will allow peaking at 100 kilowatts so 
I don't have official uh, answer to this yet, and when I do, I will I will uh, add to, uh, that to my next show or whenever I get that information. But my thought here is that it's going to come out of the gate to allow for 70 kilowatt of DC fast charging. Um, based on temperature of the state of the battery at the time, we'll, we'll see how far it peaks up to 100. So let's say the battery is very cool when you start, you might start off getting 100 if you're at a DC fast charger that will support that. You'll start getting 100 and then of course it'll start to either throttle down because of heat or as the battery fills up it'll start tapering as it usually does for any uh, battery electric vehicle. So that's how I see that happening. Uh, but again that, that's faster than you're getting today so that's good. Um, it's got 25% increase in energy density as well for those packs. Packs are almost the same size as the current packs. is about a 5 millimeter increase in overall height. Um, I think that's based on, on 16 inch wheels. Um, but basically the car's exterior and interior dimensions are unchanged. Now the, the warranty stays the same. 8 years, 160,000 kilometers or 100,000 miles, whichever uh, comes first on that. Uh, another little tidbit that I saw from the press release and reading some articles is that it looks like the standard features, the safety features uh, of uh, you know lane assist, um, blind spot monitoring, um, all this kind of stuff are going to be standard on all models. And I'll get confirmation on that, but I think they were only with the mid and upper trims prior to that on the 40 kilowatt. But it looks like the E Plus will, will add those safety features as standard across all the three or four model lines, depending on what geography you're in. Uh, and one of the other cool things about the uh, the E Plus is it's going to come to with a new screen with a new infotainment center. But this is going to be an even better infotainment. It's going to be an eight inch touch screen and full color, of course, and a nicer screen. It's going to have better smartphone integration, which means that it's actually going to look like a smartphone itself. You'll be able to swipe and, and tap and do all these kind of things like you do on your phone today on your smartphone today. So it'll have a little bit better user interface with it. It'll also um, uh, provide a, a new nav. So that's that's good. A lot of people are going great. It'll, I think, it'll probably come into the 21st century from a navigation perspective. It should should render faster and give you a better screen and all the other goodies that more update navs give you. Uh, one of the other uh, cool features, if you haven't heard this, is it looks like Nissan supporting over-the-air updates because they've announced that applications, maps, and firmware are going to be updated over the air with the simple touch of a button. Uh, today, if you're not familiar with the Leaf, you can use the Nissan Connect services and you can download, you can update your, um, you know, if you want to find out, update the local charging areas around you, charging stations around you. There, there's some updates that you can, but you have to manually go and get that. You can do that kind of over the air today. That's allowable, but you, you know, you can't uh, upgrade the firmware or the BMS in the car. You got to go to the dealer and they got to use their software. The maps have to be an SD card, I believe. So you have to go and get another SD card and put it in and this kind of stuff. And the applications need to be either dealer installed or so forth. Now, a lot of people are asking, especially in Europe, is this going to support CCS? Is it just Chatamo only? My understanding is it's Chatamo only because I, they show a picture of the ports in the front and it looks exactly the same as the 40 kilowatts. You've got your standard J1772 and you look what it looks like, your standard Chatamo Chatham port. It's just got a different cover on it for the E plus. It's got an E plus logo on the charger cap, the quick charging cap. So I don't see anything right now for support of CCS. Maybe from a Euro spec, it might change. I, I'm not sure because the European ones are built in the UK and they're shipped there. Um, I'm going to try to get answers on that one. So when I do, I'll uh, let you folks know in an update on that. Um, so that's really kind of the main features. The rest of the car itself will remain unchanged. The interior remains the same, whether, you know, beyond the infotainment, whether you love it or hate it. Um, again, it's a choice perspective and it's good, but you know, it's a, all around a good, pretty good, comfortable car handles decently. It's got a lot of room for the hatch and so forth. Now pricing. What I can tell you is that for the UK, it's been uh, it's been already thrown out there of about 45,500 euro. Um, and I'm not sure if that's for the top spec uh, model or not. Um, I saw something around the 36.5 uh, uh, sterling pound price perspective. That's what I had seen. So I'm assuming that's a base price. For Japan, they're talking about uh, 4.1 4, 4. million yen, if I forgot that correct, around 38,370 uh, I'm taking that, that to mean euro from a conversion. The expected price in the U.S. is, again, to be around 35000 as a base price for that. So that would be the S trim. Uh, but hopefully we'll get that soon. And that would equate to, uh, you know, somewhere probably in the 37 to 39 because it doesn't really go by exchange from Canada perspective. We'll have to wait and see how it, how it, how it holds for Canadian pricing because I don't have that yet. 
Um, so that'll be announced closer to the on sale date. Um, so, you know, I'm glad that Nissan at least is moving the ER sticks forward. And as I get more information, hopefully I'll get some, some, uh, I've got some questions that I want to ask Nissan about this. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to ask them and put that on video when I do the car show next week. Um, but again, it's exciting that Nissan is at least moving forward on this. So stay tuned for more information. Now, on the subject of Nissan, I just wanted to give a quick update as well. Um, there's been a lot of talk, and I believe I mentioned it uh, last show or the show before, because I'm doing so much stuff, folks, that, uh, you know, with work and trying to get these shows going, and with the Christmas holidays done now, uh, it was fairly busy, so I don't remember what show it was. But when I talked about the electric suite in the report that he did, that he, he felt that there was a BMS software change that allowed the Nis the current 40 kilowatt hour Nissan Leafs to charge a little, to, to limit, you know, throttle a little differently, so that they could gain an increase in charging speeds at a little bit higher temperatures. Um, well, it seems that, that there's some different versions of the BMS, and I want to thank, I want to give a shout out to Aaron. Uh, he does a YouTube show in the UK. He's got a Nissan Leaf as well, and he talks a lot of stuff about his Leaf. He sent me some information that it looks like he's discovered that the BMS version that has this change is version C. Uh, it seems like version A was on the launch models, um, uh, the early earlier launch models. Uh, B was in the early to mid part of 2018. I guess this is dependent on geography as well, folks. And then the version C was uh, from November of 2018 onward. So it seems like cars that have version C of the of the um, um, BMS um, are have that fix or have that change i wouldn't say it's a fix but have that amendment to the throttling um, speeds that will allow them to get garner more throughput um, for a little longer time before it starts throttling now again battery tapering all that stuff is all natural stuff all evs do that so that's a little different but this should help alleviate some of the concerns for some of the people that do want to drive the leaf longer distances and don't want to wait double or you know two and a half times longer for a rapid charger they normally would this should help but i'll keep my eye on this because i haven't really seen a lot of use cases yet or a lot of intrinsic testing that i've done so hopefully we'll see um what happens there and uh, i suspect that this type of bms will be on the 60 kilowatt 62 kilowatt hour e plus leaf as well to allow obviously it's, it has faster charging capability so it will allow it to charge faster longer and another update on Nissan, they've, uh, for the Infinity brand, they've uh, come out uh, with a QX Inspiration concept. Um, I, I try not to do a lot of concept cars, but I think what we're seeing is a trend for concepts actually to be, when they come out in some cases, to be much more closer to what production vehicles are going to be than normally would have been in the past. Now, some concept vehicles, you can look at them and going, that's a really concept vehicle, right? It's way out there. But you know, when they, when they start showing stuff like this, um, it's not too far from what could be reality. Now they are going to actually premiere at the Detroit North American International Auto Show. I will be there for that and I will capture some video and I'll climb around on this thing and uh, and ask some questions about it as well. But it's it's cool to see that that uh, Nis that Infinity and Nissan, of course, is continuing with its, its electrification strategy. Um, this is going to be an updated design language on the QX. Uh, it was This was seen on the Inspiration concept as well earlier, the Q concept, but it's really kind of a, a new era as Nissan continues with that more sleek elements. Um, I have no, no, no stats as far as batteries and all this kind of stuff, but you know, this is a larger type of almost crossover vehicle, really, uh, that's supposed to come out in 2021, so it's still a couple of years away. Um, but, um, you know, certainly it's going to have a decent battery pack based on the size and so forth, you know, from, from a little bit larger crossover, a small SUV type vehicle. But nice to see um, Nissan continuing on the Infinity side of the fence, and I'll report more information on this when I get it. All right, just change gears into Volkswagen. Now, I did a lot of talk about Volkswagen and the ID in the last few shows as well. Uh, but I want to thank a viewer who had sent me an email with some information from a link that over of, of an article that he had written. This is Fred Magni um, Skillebake, and I'm probably butchered your name, Fred. I'm very sorry. I don't know how to pronounce Norwegian names, but I want to thank you very much uh, for sending me the information. Um, basically, um, I know that VW had done a lot of um, uh, public outreach and press stuff in uh, the Scandinavian countries uh, a few months, a couple of months ago. 
And some of those, some of that information has been filtering across. Uh, but basically, um, Fred was able to send me more information, which I wanted to share today about the ID. So obviously, I think I've mentioned before that Volkswagen plans on building about 10 million electric cars on this MEB platform, which is the platform that they're using to uh, for their stand for at least most of the models from a standard electrification standpoint. Um, and now they've produced enough raw materials to produce those 10 millions uh, of, of vehicles with today's technology. So that obviously. I talked about you know money they're spending on securing battery suppliers. They've got a couple of battery suppliers and all that kind of stuff um, to get to that 10 million. Um, they're all looking to change um, as well energy density in the batteries, um, focusing more on nickel, uh, I guess, than cobalt, because I know we've had talk about cobalt here. So try, looking to ways to increase the energy density and developing batteries by 2030 that will have you know twice or more as much energy than they do uh, in today's levels um, as well. There will be four models, of course, uh, on the VW before 2025, so within the next few years. And these will be from the VW group, and there'll be some other brands. Um, this platform, MEV platform, will also be used by Audi, Seat, and Skoda, which are part of the VW group, for them to produce electrification electric vehicles. So there'll be more coming out from those guys. But again, this article talks uh, about the amount of energy and density. In fact, sorry, I do. So the first, there's... there's um, couple type of cells they're going to look at they're going to look at their pouch designs their prismatic cells and then the um, cylindrical type as well they're going to end up more with a pouch and prismatic designs from what i understand um, they're going to be modular batteries of course um, which everybody is working on now the the ids are going to come out with a small medium large and i've talked a lot about that but some of the more details that kind of filter through is that the entry level model uh, should um uh, have a 48 kilowatt hour battery pack uh, distributed over seven modules. Uh, the middle uh, trim level will have nine battery modules with a capacity of 62 kilowatt hour. And the largest battery pack for the ID initial ID lineup will have 12 battery modules, which will house a 82 kilowatt hour at most. That number could change slightly, but that's kind of the highest one from a battery pack perspective. Um, now, the, the smallest ID model will be a real, rear wheel drive. So for you rear wheel drive enthusiasts, that's good. It'll kind of like the i3 and everything. Uh, but the other uh, models, the middle and the higher end models, will, will, will have both two and four wheel drive or all wheel drive options to them. And uh, that means from an ID cross or a vision, you know, you can get um, dual wheel or all wheel drive. Um, they're going to support CCS combo, so I know that over, or, already people are shouting, yay, in Europe, especially CCS, that's great, and some in the U.S., I guess. Um, so they're going, to, they're going to support that for all the lines. They're initially, for the smallest pack, it'll have a charging limit of, of about 50 kilowatts for quick charging, but you can get up to 100 or 125 for some of the mid or larger battery packs, depending on what options you have. From a pricing perspective, what was kind of stated already by VW, and again, these are subject to change, folks, so don't hold me to them, but the, the standard base ID will cost of about 25,000 euro in Germany, and that equates to about uh, 250 Norwegian currency, and I, I just lost what that currency is, but somebody I'm sure will tell me. Uh, or about just uh, just over 29,000 USD, uh, about 30, just 39,000 Canadian, and uh, 22, just under 23,000 sterling pound for Great Britain for the UK. So um, that's a very attractive price point, and that's before incentives. So if you're, you know, VW still has a ways to go for the U.S. tax credit and uh, state credits and incentives and all this kind of stuff that's out there. Um, the first IDs should start coming out towards the end of this year, of 2019. Um, some of them will get, you know, the, the big, bigger models will have possibilities for trailer hitches and that kind of stuff, uh, because a lot of people are asking, uh, always want to look at hooking up a trailer to their EV. So anyway, some, some more information on the ID, which hopefully will continue to gardener excitement. And as I continue to get more throughout these car show season that we're coming up to in the, in the first part of this year, I will let you know. Right before I get to the end of the show, I do have another mailbag, and I'm always excited and happy to get mailbag. Thank you very much, everybody, for 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 do reaching out to me for through comments or mailbag. So I have a mail from a gentleman named Richard Owen, and Richard, I don't think you told me where you're from, but thank you very much for sending me the email. It's much appreciated. Now Richard has a really good question. He's he says that he's he's thinking about getting a Leaf. Uh, Nissan Leaf as, as a battery electric vehicle. And he's wondered if, if I have any feedback for 
elderly people uh, or seniors or however, you know, um, uh, greatly matured, um, vastly experienced adults, however you want to call people that I'm not that far. I'm actually considered a senior in some circles now uh, based on my age. But, um, you know, he's talking about uh, folks who are in their, their late 60s into their mid 70s, specifically, I guess, uh, as they are. Um, now, they're not into, especially his wife, he says, is not into modern tech at all. They're really not technophobes from that perspective. They get, the, you know, and that happens with a lot of folks, uh, you know, a little bit uh, older statue. Uh, new technology, iPhones and Androids, all this stuff is very new. You know, it's really only in the last 10 years or so, 15 years or so, that we're seeing this kind of technology. So if you're a 70 or a 65 or an 80 year old, you know, for the majority of your life, you're not used to this technology. So it can be overwhelming. So the questions he's asking me if I've gotten a remarks as far as looking at, um, you know, what, what I could tell folks who might be looking specifically at the LEAF or it, even other electric vehicles, um, whether this could be a challenge. Well, I'm flying off the uh, off the you know just off the top of my head here, Richard. So thank you very much for sending me the email. I appreciate it. What I can tell you is this: from a, a electric vehicle perspective, all EVs have have technology associated with it. It's just kind of a must thing. You you've got to have some fundamental understanding, a little bit about about what some of the controls mean, what some of the screens mean, especially when you're talking about battery charging, about battery range, um, all that kind of stuff. You really don't have to get too involved in regeneration and all that kind of stuff. That'll just work on its own. But you do need to understand some of the basic um, displays and some of the basic information that electric vehicles give you. Now, from a LEAF perspective, as I mentioned earlier, it's got a pretty basic display. It doesn't really give you a lot of bells and whistles from an information perspective. And they've done that on purpose because they want the LEAF to kind of just be an average car. So it doesn't doesn't really kind of confuse people you know the first gen leaf was a little bit you know confusing maybe for people that weren't technology centric because it was a little bit more stuff uh, so they've kind of you know streamlined that a little bit to just be a bit more normal so looking from from that perspective so they don't really want you to care a whole lot about a lot of the specs and a lot of the stats there from a Nissan perspective now put that against the model 3 of course which has fully touchscreen based interface and controls as obviously is a couple of buttons there on the steering wheel uh, but obviously buttons are it's, it's pretty well buttons and less from that perspective so it's a, it's totally the opposite way so certainly i don't think a model 3 would be a good choice for you if you're not familiar with technology and if you're you know not very comfortable with technology like that um, but the leaf has pretty good technology for what it has but i think it would be a good choice uh, for somebody of your stature um, to, to look at because again it's not going to be intimidating um, the bolt as well it's not overly uh, intimidating but it, it does have a bit more stuff than even the leaf so it might be a little bit challenging uh, the ionic is pretty well mostly looks just like a regular car as well so that might not be a bad choice now it sits a little lower than the leaf so getting in and out for uh, for seniors uh, could be a little bit more challenging depend on your physical shape but that's something to think about and then of course the the myriad of some of the crossovers that are coming or the small SUVs like the Kona or potentially the Nero EV could be something Richard that you might want to hold out for you a little bit of higher sitting position I, I think the technology in that as well is fairly you know easier to understand there's not a whole lot of understand the main thing you need to know is if, if you're going to charge it at home then you need to just be aware of what your your charge is on the battery and where you're at and where you're going whether or not you have enough range to get there those are kind of the two main factors that you have to be concerned about just like you have to know how much fuel is in your tank and how much you know how much range can i go on this gas that's in my ice vehicle if i want to get somewhere though it's really the same concept so th there's not much difference from a battery versus an ice fee there so hopefully that helps. Um, I really can't think of anything else. You'll certainly like having zero emissions, a quiet vehicle. All battery electric cars are really quiet. Uh, the other day I was driving through a country road and some people were walking down it. They didn't even hear me coming. I actually had to honk my horn about 10 feet from them. I wasn't going very fast uh, down there and uh, before they moved out of the way. So these can, these cars can be very quiet. They're very comfortable. Um, and you get that instant torque and you get that power when you need it to get you out of situations or to get up and go. So good on you. I'd like to hear, uh, uh, Richard, how things work out for you. And if anybody has any other questions that they want to send me, please do. Um, let me give you some information on how you can reach me as the show is over and i'll close it off by supplying that information you can email me at g at 
evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. I love emails, as I mentioned. Please continue to send me those, uh, and I will, I will always uh, answer them and get back to you. Uh, if you're following me on Twitter, please continue to do so. If not, you can find my uh, find me on Twitter at evrevshow is my Twitter handle. I should have this memorized, folks, but I have to keep looking at my notes here just to make sure that I'm saying the right stuff. I got so much stuff going on. I want to make sure I get it right. You're watching this on YouTube. I thank you for that. If you have not subscribed and clicked the subscription button, please do so. It would mean a lot to me. You can click that bell as well to get automatically notified when I push a new show up. As I mentioned on the last show, I've launched Instagram. You can find me, EV Revolution Show, on Instagram. I'll continue to slowly increase my pictures and my videos and stuff on Instagram as I get used to it and get into it. But I'm at least uh, on Instagram. I continue to do the audio podcast. You can find those uh, EV Revolution Show audio podcasts through uh, iTunes, through your podcast app, through Google Play, uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. Tune in radio, Spotify, Stitcher, all that good stuff. And, and you might find me on something else i don't even know anymore what i'm on and uh so please check those out now i did not get a chance to record an audio podcast last weekend i was uh, going to we had to change schedules but i will have one coming up within the next week or so and i hope you look forward to that and as always a heartfelt thanks to my patreon supporters um, i really appreciate your support if you don't know what patreon is you can go to www.patreon.com forward slash ev revolution show and get some information on what I'm what I'm doing on Patreon. If you want feel like you want to support me, that would be much appreciated. But you certainly don't have to. So thank you very much for that. And on that note, that's the end of episode 26 of the EV Revolution Show. Hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, please everybody stay safe. Thanks for sending me emails, and I'll see you next time. Uh-huh.